Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's senior speeches for the class of 2025. Our Our first speaker today is Ruby Sullivan. Ruby will be introduced by her sister, Alice. The day that I was born started with my parents buying Ruby a Lego set and telling her that it was a gift from me. Ruby, being two and a half at the time, believed every word of it. We know now that that was in fact not true, but it definitely started our relationship off on a high note. Although I did allegedly get her that Lego set 14 years ago, we still had our ups and downs. Like how one time, I threw a straw at her and she somehow started bleeding in the face, or the time I punched her and accidentally ended up ripping out a chunk of her hair. I'm sorry for both of those things, by the way. We fight as often as any siblings do, but we also have our times when we do get along. Like when she takes me to crumble, or lets me be on aux during our car rides to school. In all seriousness, being alone at home is going to feel so weird, and honestly, standing up here right now, I can't imagine it yet. But I do know that I can't wait for her to call, visit, and hang out when she does come home from wherever she ends up going. Now, without further ado, Ruby Sullivan. Good morning. As a kid, I was afraid of many things. I was scared of typical things like the dark and basements, but I was also scared of many irrational things. To name a few, stop motion clay animation, which started after I watched the movie Chicken Run. I want to preface this by saying I now have a lot of respect for the animators who put in the hundreds of hours of work required to make these kinds of movies, but at four years old, the uncanny movements of the characters terrified me. Although I've attempted to watch Coraline a few times, I've not seen another stop motion movie since. Another irrational fear I had was YouTube. As a nine-year-old with an iPad, I had complete access to the internet. One day, I stumbled upon a seemingly funny video of the Cartoon Network show Clarence. It was a fan-made edit of Clarence's friendship with a disfigured baby doll with the song Pumped Up Kicks by Foster the People playing in the background. At first, I felt fine, but that night, the image of the decaying doll haunted me, and I wasn't able to sleep for a week. I swore off YouTube for an entire year after watching that video scared of what other seemingly funny videos I could accidentally watch. Finally, my biggest and probably dumbest irrational chi childhood fear was fish. There is just something about the fact that they don't have eyelids and are scaly and slimy that just didn't sit right with me. This fear got so huge that I started to spiral into a kind of insanity. I was scared of going to the bathroom because I thought a fish would be in the toilet bowl. I stopped drinking liquids that weren't clear because I thought a fish could be swimming in it and I just couldn't see it. I couldn't eat at restaurants with fish tanks because it grossed me out so badly. My sister got a pet fish, which she ruthlessly killed within a few weeks, although she claims it was an accident, but how could it be an accident if she immediately dissected it in the backyard with our silverware? <laughs> I memorized the, the specific details on the butter knife that she used for her experiment, so I would never eat with it or any other silverware it touched. There is no way any of that was normal. However, as I've gotten older, my fears have matured. Now I'm afraid of more common things, like public speaking. At the end of last year, I applied to be president of Flight Club 502, but I completely disregard disregarded the tremendous amount of public speaking that I have to do in this position. During the first full member meeting, I had to give a speech introducing the club officers and their committees. I went up on stage, and as I started to speak, I forgot every single person's name. I stared blankly at them, and they stared blankly back at me. This awkward onstage exchange lasted about 30 seconds before Eleanor Cantrell luckily saved me and whispered every person's name to me as I said them aloud into the microphone. Another one of my mature fears is simply not knowing what to do. Since becoming a restaurant hostess, my job has been pretty simple. However, there have been countless times when the restaurant has reached full capacity, the kitchen is backed up, the servers are rushing, the managers are occupied, and a party of 25 walks through the door expecting immediate seating. Grown adults have screamed in my face because I haven't been able to instantly accommodate them. Although the thought of dealing with these situations continues to scare me, I know avoiding them would be a greater issue. If we avoid our fears, they control us. But when we confront them, we learn to recognize them when they reappear, and we can face them again. Fear has held me back from countless opportunities, but I've learned that just facing it head on will work out. At the beginning of this year, I was terrified to quit the sport that I had dedicated three years to in order to try something new. 
A few weeks ago, I started playing squash, and although I can admit I'm absolutely awful, I have no regrets about joining. Right now, I'm scared of so many things, but mostly for the future. I'm scared of living in a completely new environment next year for college. I'm scared of not being able to come home every day and listen to my sister complain about guys. I'm scared of not being able to find someone to run random errands with like Sarah just because we want to hang out. But I know that I'll be held back if I don't face them. So even though I still won't eat sushi or watch any clay animation, I will continue to face my fears and work past them to live my life to the fullest. And I recommend you all do the same. Thank you. Our second speaker today is Lila Salisbury. Lila will be introduced by her father, Dwight Salisbury. Thank you and good morning. Uh, obviously it was a tremendous honor for Lila to ask me to introduce her for her senior speech. Lila is truly an amazing, smart, funny, engaging person and I know she's made tremendous connections and friends here at Collegiate that she will value forever. But I wanted to take a minute and fill you in on a side of Lila that some of you may not be aware of. I've had season tickets to UK football for a number of years, and for most of that time, I've had to just find people to go with me to the games because Lila and her mom, for that matter, did never really cared that much about going. But a few years ago, Lila decided to tag along. Kentucky was playing Florida, and they won on the last play of the game. Stadium went crazy, students stormed the field, Lila was hooked, and a college football fan was born. Her time with me at the game since then have been some of my most treasured memories. I know that Lila will carry that passion for college football wherever her future plans take her, and I know that she will remember and cherish all the friends and connections that she made here at Collegiate. Please join me in welcoming our next senior speaker, Lila Salisbury. Almost every time I leave the house, I get hit with the familiar phrase, make good choices. Easier said than done. I'm a very indecisive person, but I've realized an unfortunate trend where when I do decide to be spontaneous and make a decision, it's more often than not the wrong one. Now, I'm not talking about life-altering really, really bad decisions. I simply lack common sense. The simple idea of just figuring it out is pretty much foreign to me. I can't even count all the situations where I have made the worst possible decision and looked back and thought, wow, what I should have done is actually really, really obvious. One infamous time in sixth grade, we were climbing the rock wall in PE when I made a spectacularly frustrating decision. As I was sitting on the gym floor waiting my turn to climb the wall, I was determined to conquer my fear of heights that I inherited from my mother. I knew with determination I could get to the top. As you can probably predict, that did not in fact happen. About halfway up, the floor seemed to be alarmingly far away, and I decided I was done. Before we had started the epic climb, the teachers reminded us that in order to come down, we needed to sit down in the harness. I guess I either forgot about this warning or thought it just, just didn't apply to me. I pushed off the wall and was met with a gasp from my onlooking classmates when I suddenly found myself upside down in the harness. There I was, hanging upside down in the air in front of a bunch of 11-year-olds. I started to panic and flail around like a crazy person, which definitely made the situation way, way worse, something I might have known if I had stopped to think for two seconds. Thankfully, my dire situation was soon corrected as against all odds, I somehow managed to get myself right side up and was miraculously brought back down to the mat, although I was a sobbing wreck for the rest of the day. Sometimes my impatience and bad decision making tend to get me into somewhat sticky situations and I've definitely done some things that could have gone not at all well. For example, once a friend and I decided to go to a certain all boys Catholic schools baseball game. Both she and I ended up getting there later than we intended and by the time we got to the game it was already in the middle of one of the later innings. She was waiting for me inside the stadium so I was in a hurry to get out of the car. I meandered through the parking lot, enjoying the beautiful spring night, when I heard yelling coming from the stadium. I looked up, figuring that someone got a home run. 
I noticed that the boys I could see in the upper level seemed to be looking out to the parking lot where I was walking and pointing in my general direction. I chose to disregard this, but the yelling only intensified. I noticed a baseball fly out of the stadium right toward me. I had a split second to make a decision that might be literally life or death, and in a classic move, I made the decision that not many others would have made. I decided to keep walking and not adjust my course in the slightest. Thankfully, the baseball ricocheted off a tree and I was unharmed. When I got in the stadium, I greeted my friend waiting for me and she asked if I had gotten hit by the baseball. It was then that I realized that that whole stadium had been yelling at me to get out of the way. From that day on, I decided to never ignore a bunch of people yelling and looking in my direction or any kind of random flying object. Something that you'd think would be common sense, but I guess it's just not that easy. Another significant example of my slight incompetence, incompetence at making decisions is my many driving adventures. I've had my full license for about a year, and while I wouldn't consider myself to be a good driver, I'm definitely not as bad as I once was. There was a time, however, when I didn't really understand the whole concept of directions. In my opinion, the most annoying thing about this city is the sheer amount of one-way streets downtown. I think it's absolutely unnecessary and frankly stupid to have a road that doesn't go in both directions. One instance of being victimized by ignorance in one-way streets took place when I first got my intermediate license. I felt so independent and grown and awesome being able to finally go places by myself that one day I decided to go joyriding on my way home from the store. I somehow wound up downtown, which definitely was not part of the plan, but my trip was going pretty smooth. This was until I decided to turn onto a street without reading the signs around it. I totally saw the sign, I just didn't pay any attention because I was, in my opinion, basically a professional driver. I was heading down the street at a very legal 35 miles an hour when I noticed headlights facing me. I thought this was peculiar, but maybe that car was turning left and would soon be on the other side of the road. That fantasy disappeared from mind a mere seconds later when the headlights were way closer than before. To my horror, I deduced that maybe I was in fact the problem here, but I was totally on the right-hand side of the road. I came to the realization that this was a dreaded one-way street. I only had a few seconds to ponder my predicament when I saw a true act of God in front of me. There was a driveway leading into a parking lot on my right. I skidded into the lot just in time to maintain my precious life, but not before the other driver yelled a few choice words out his window. <laughs> After composing myself, I started to head home and spent the entire rest of my trip eyeing my back mirror to make sure I wasn't being trailed by any cops on a mission to lock up wrong way drivers. Thankfully, I walked away from the incident with no wounds other than a burning hatred for one-way streets and a new admiration for road signs. Maybe when I get older, I'll finally develop any kind of sense, or maybe I won't. I know there will be plenty more bad decisions in my life, and hopefully none of them will have truly catastrophic consequences. I think it's safe to say that these events and plenty more of my life experiences, some of which aren't worth repeating, have taught me more than a few things not to do. Although ideal, I don't think anyone can truly know exactly what to do in a situation. The next best thing is to, unlike me, try to use reason and not do or say the first thing that comes to mind. We'll all have to make hundreds of thousands of decisions in our futures, and hopefully some of those can be better than the decisions I made. Thank you. Our third speaker today is Ryan Arif. <laughs> Ryan will be introduced by his best friend, Fernando Valdez. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, again, my name is Fernando Valdezon, and uh, I am very excited to introduce my friend, Ryan Arif. Even though I am twice Ryan's age, I do consider him a very good friend, maybe even best friends. I have known Ryan since he was 10 years old, uh, the same age that my son is right now. From a young age, I knew Ryan was a gifted uh, athlete and squash player. I started spending a lot of time with Ryan uh, after COVID on the court. 
Ryan has always been a student of the game, and every time we have intense matches afterwards, we put everything aside and we give each other pointers on how to be better. Our relationship has since evolved, and I've been fortunate enough to see Ryan mature into a wonderful young man. We don't, play, we don't just play squash and train together. We talk about all things from sports to college to business and life in general. My friendship with Ryan has come full circle now that he has become a friend and mentor to my son, Trey. Without even asking, Ryan has stepped in and been a big brother to Trey on and off the court. Ryan is comfortable in his own skin and doesn't let outside pressures influence his decisions. Whether it's hanging out with a 10 year old or taking a Greyhound bus to Chicago just to coach and become a better player, these are just the things that he does to better himself. These are the, also the leadership qualities that got him the captain spot on the collegiate squash team. Ryan will be heading to Denison College next year and I'm very excited to follow his squash career and even more excited to see how he grows as a person. Trey will be waiting for you to come back and see his buddy, his buddy again and maybe by then he'll be ready for some girl advice. And once again everybody, here's Ryan Arif. Good morning. When I started thinking about this speech, I realized that most of my friends and family would expect me to discuss some of the most common things about me. Starting with something like how much time I dedicated playing squash, or how most of my free time during clubs and activities was spent arguing with my friends, which ended up with us cuddling on the couch in Ms. Dietz's room. <laughs> or I could write about how much blood, sweat, and tears I put into my junior year AP Bio class, which was filled with some of the smartest kids. Dr. Shannon, Maybe you were right and guided me to take regular science. Or maybe people would have expected me to write about my willingness to exceed Mr. Sutherland's swipe card expectations by gaining 30 points through my high school years for simply forgetting to wear my lanyard around my neck. Sorry, Mr. Sutherland. With all these highlights in my collegiate career, you would think it would be easy to write a senior speech. But I wanted to talk about something a little bit more challenging. Let me set the scene. Driving home, the rain poured relentlessly as my favorite ASAP, Ro ASAP Rocky song pulsed through my speakers. The rhythm energized me, a stark contrast to the growing intensity of the storm outside. My mind was free, and I was excited to drive through the night with the intense rain hitting my car. But as I merged onto the highway, the rain intensified, and the once rhythmic beat of my music became a dis distant murmur. The thunder cracked, shaking the car in my resolve. Visibility was nearly zero, with only the vehicle, vehicle ahead providing a glimmer of gu gu guidance to the downpour. I felt a rising unease, my heart pounding with the thunder. The temptation to pull over was strong, but I focused intently on maintaining a safe distance from the vehicle in front of me. Just as I decided to increase the space between us, the car ahead, a black Toyota, lost control. It hydroplaned, skidded, and collided with the highway divider. I slammed on my brakes, thrusting forward as my car skidded to a halt. The shock was immediate, and my senses matched the severity of the situation. I had to do something. I leaped from my car to the side of the highway where the Toyota was crumpled against the median. The scene was disastrous. Shards of glass on the road, the twisted metal of the Toyota Stark against the stormy night. Many thoughts rushed through my head. I thought about my safety and the safety of whoever was in that car. For a few, for free, few brief moments, I was scared and hesitant, and I approached the vehicle with heavy discomfort. The doors of the car were jammed and stuck from the wreck. I decided to climb through the shattered windshield. A man was slumped over with the airbag plastered against his body. He was middle-aged, unconscious, and limp. I could not tell if he was breathing. Once I was through the windshield, I quickly picked him up and swiftly laid his body against my arms. Unable to look the man in his eyes, I briefly scanned his body, seeing all the wounds that the crash had bestowed upon him. I struggled through the rain and the broken windshield. I had to get him out of the car while maneuvering around the broken shards of glass as I carefully tried to carry him back to my car. I laid him in the back seat as I fumbled for my cup phone to call 911. <laughs> Waiting for the ambulance felt like an eternity. I had many things going through my mind. Could I have done anything differently to help him? What else could I have done rather than just waiting for the ambulance? My confusing and overbearing thoughts and the immense amount of adrenaline I felt left me in a state of shock. Once the ambulance arrived, the paramedics took over, moving with the practice to urgency. They muttered a quick thanks and I watched them load the man at the amb ambulance. The door closed with the finality, leaving me uncertain and shaken in the rain. I drove home in silence, my hands still trembling on the wheel, the night's event replaying my mind like a haunting memory I couldn't escape. 
I'm not sharing this story out of pride or to show how I helped, but because I generally don't know what happened to him after I left. I don't know if I could have or should have done anything differently. That uncertainty still leaves me questioning whether what I did was the right thing. I don't know his name or anything about his family. I just have to live with the unknown. I questioned my actions for weeks, wondering what I could have done differently. The trauma of that night lingered. I couldn't shake the image of the man lying limp in my back seat with a feeling of helplessness as I waited for help to arrive. For the next few months, I couldn't process my emotions. I was quiet and couldn't muster the courage to say anything to anyone. I began to feel that I was trapped in my head, replaying the scene over and over. I was scared to talk about the accident. I was afraid how it would affect people close to me, even how my family would view me, because I hadn't yet told my parents about that night either. I wasn't being vulnerable. I stayed in my bubble and pretended I was okay, even though it affected me every day. It wasn't until I finally opened up and decided to become vulnerable that these emotions became ones to reflect on rather to dwell on. I was sitting in the Jeff Nones parking lot with two of my close friends, Mikey and Noah Sosa, when I realized that I didn't have to carry these feelings alone. They sensed something was wrong long before I said anything, but I was scared that opening up would worsen everything, but it didn't. They started asking questions, and Mikey, being the stubborn person he is, made the push for me to become vulnerable and to share the tough feelings that I had. Something as little as hanging out with friends can help much more than one can think. Even if your friends have to pry it out of you, the words start coming out, and a load gets taken off your shoulders. Opening up didn't make things worse, it made things better. It allowed me to start healing and to let go of some of that weight I once had. I began to realize that these walls I had built around myself were only keeping me from growing. Their support was a reminder that vulnerability, while scary, is necessary for growth. This goes for any situation in life. If you're ever feeling some weight on your shoulders, you don't need to tell the whole upper school your deepest, darkest feelings, but it's okay to open up and be vulnerable. Discomfort, whether it's facing a traumatic experience or simply sharing something vulnerable with those close to you, can feel unbearable in the moment, but in those moments of discomfort where we find out who we are. We grow when we step into uncomfortable, push past the fears of opening up, and allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Thank you.